What's up, Modern at Grace Avenue? I am so glad you have joined us today from wherever you are. We are going to worship, so let's sing this out. Tell me. Tell me all your secrets. Tell me everything. Show me how to love you. Show me how to live wherever I go, whatever I do. All I want is to be with you. I want to know your heartbeat, heartbeat. Show me how your heartbeat, heartbeat. The rhythm of your love is for me. I want to know your, I want to know your heartbeat. You capture my attention. You capture my attention with love so wild and free. You light my soul on fire, and I'm burning with your dreams. I want to know your heartbeat, heartbeat. Show me. Welcome home to Grace Avenue. I hope that you are awake and ready with this wonderful change of time that we have. Um, this afternoon, you'll be able to experience a little bit more sunshine. So we have to look for the positive in all of this at some point. Um, my name is Kristen Lane, and I'm the Minister of Discipleship, and I am honored to be at worship with you today. If you are um, a first-time guest, we uh, welcome you, and we ask that you send us a, a note in the chat, or when you register your attendance this morning, we ask that you fill out a little bit of information for us. Let us know how we can be present for you and how we can help create a home for you in Grace Avenue. We ask that everybody register their attendance, not just first-time guests. As we move into the, we are in the fourth Sunday of Lent. And during this time, we have had Bible studies taking place, Zoom calls that you can participate in, and many mission opportunities. You can find out more information about all of these events and opportunities on our website at graceavenue.org. Click on the Lent tab, and it will take you to everything that you need to know um, including a Bible study that meets tonight at 7, that's the way, and then also for our children and family uh, 
prayer labyrinth that is today as well. Both Zoom links can be found on our website. Um, our Easter information, our Holy Week and Easter information is also out and on our website. Go ahead and click that link and um, take a moment to look through it so you can begin to plan that week. Um, we have prayer opportunities and um, gathering opportunities during um, Holy Week and Easter, and we would love to see your family or be present for your family during that time. Okay. We now turn to the lighting of our candle, our Christ candle. Our Christ candle reminds us that we are joined together, even though we are not sitting right next to each other. Christ is ever present. Christ will always be with us. And we begin to worship. Let's continue our time of worship. Well, every week we read our community values statements. And that is just a way for us to stay connected as a, as a community and to remember the things that matter to us and the things that bind us together. So if you would, read these along with me from wherever you are. Here in modern at Grace Avenue, we gather as a unified community from all walks of life. Without exception, we belong. We affirm and embrace people from every race, ethnicity, age, economic status, marital status, gender or sexual identity, ability or faith background, because all people reflect the face of God. Without exception, we belong. We seek to embody God's grace and justice in our community and in our world. And we recognize that historically, the church hasn't always done that. Part of our work together is to help right some of those wrongs. Without exception, we belong. In this space, we bring our full selves. We engage our minds. We struggle with our doubts. We cultivate sustainability. And we carry one another's burdens. Without exception. We belong. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears are gone.
to remind you that uh, it's a big week. This week, last year, the world shut down, and we, we had no idea what was coming. We had no idea the loss that we would suffer and the changes that we would endure and just the collective trauma that we would experience. It's, it's been a really hard year for a lot of us, for all of us. And, you know, we have been lucky to get to experience online worship in all different kinds of iterations throughout the year. Uh, that's been a really vital thing for so many of us. And so we are, we're lucky that we've had that ability. But there is something about this online experience that feels different. You know, we haven't quite been able to crack exactly what that is, but it just does feel a little bit different when we're at home. Most of us would say, you know, we, we love this online experience, but there is something different about it. And so I was talking with a friend a couple weeks ago, somebody who attends here at Modern, and we were talking about that, the thing that feels different in, in the online experience, and we kind of honed in on this idea. So there's something called, in our brains and in our bodies, it's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And what that system does is it controls hormone regulation in our bodies, and it controls things like our fight or flight response, it controls our feelings of rest, and our feelings of safety. And so it, it's the thing that causes our cortisol to go up, which is a stress hormone, and it handles things like oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone, and endorphins, which is like the classic happy hormone. The parasympathetic nervous system is the thing that regulates all of those things. And one of the amazing things about that system of the body is that one of the ways it helps regulate itself is being around people, being around safe people and in safe spaces. It's amazing, we really are created for each other and created to be in community because our bodies know when they're around safe people and in safe spaces and our hormones respond. And so this year, of course, with good reason, we haven't been able to be around those people and those spaces. We've had to, for everyone's health and everyone's safety, we've had to mostly stay away. And so what that means, though, is that for a lot of us, our parasympathetic nervous systems have just been low-level activated pretty much all year because it hasn't been able to do the regular things that it does to down-regulate itself and to help that fight-or-flight response. And our hormones just, they've been doing their best, but they haven't known how to respond to being separate. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to do a short meditation. And this is, this, I get it, this might be a little hippy-dippy, ooey-gooey for some of you, a meditation. And if that's you, I see you and I hear you and that is so okay. And you don't have to participate if you don't want to. But if you'd like to participate, this is something that we're going to try. And we're going to see if this helps connect with that parasympathetic nervous system and help us access some of those feelings of safety. And so if you would like to participate, I wanna invite you right now to either close your eyes if you're comfortable with that, or pick a soft gaze at a spot in front of you. And I just want you to take two deep breaths. (sighs) 
So I want you to remember a time from a year ago that you felt safe. And I want you to remember what it felt like in your body, what your physical body felt like. And that space might be, it might be here in this church building, greeted by warm smiles and mediocre coffee. Maybe it was at work and you were with colleagues that you loved and trusted. Or maybe you were interfacing with customers and you felt alive. Maybe you were at school surrounded by kiddos or maybe you were on vacation or maybe you were lost in a crowd. I just want you to remember one specific time where you felt very safe in your body. And I want you to think about what that felt like. Were your shoulders high or were they low? Was your forehead tight or was it relaxed? Was your jaw clenched or was it loose? Was your breathing short and shallow or was it long and deep? Was your heart rate racing or was it slow and steady? I'm gonna give you about another 30 seconds and I just want you to spend some time remembering all of the bodily sensations that it felt like to be safe. Slowly bring awareness back into the space, back into your body where you are right now in time and space. Feel your feet on the floor. Wiggle your hands and your fingers. Come back into the space that you're in. So we're going to sing one more song this morning. And this song is called It Is Well. It's based off of the old hymn, It Is Well. And as we sing this morning, let's carry with us those feelings of safety and belonging. Let's carry with us that access that we have to our parasympathetic nervous system, that we can remind ourselves that we are safe and that we belong. So let's sing this together. Grand Earth. Grand Earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of your voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. And through it all, are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Be it for me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. It is well, 
As we end our time of meditation and prayer, let us join together in the prayer that binds us by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning can be found in the book of Luke, 
chapter 13, starting with verse 10. Hear the reading of the word. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. When, she, when he saw her, Jesus called her t- to him and said, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hands on her, and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded, There are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord replied, Hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink? Then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame, but all those in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm the pastor of Modern Worship here at Grace Avenue, and I'm so glad to be worshiping with you today in sermon, scripture, song, prayer, and meditation as we grow in our relationship with God together. We are in the fourth Sunday of Lent. And during the Lenten season, we've been doing a sermon series entitled The Way of Christ. The basic idea of this series is that Christians, before they were called Christians, the earliest Christians were actually called followers of the way. They were called this because they understood that the path and pattern of how Jesus called them to live was different than anything else they'd ever been taught. And not only did Jesus show them the way, but their commitment to Jesus made him the embodiment of their belief. Jesus was the way and the truth and the life. And during the Lenten season, as we journey with Christ towards the cross, we are reminding ourselves of the way that Jesus called us to live and how we are to live in community with one another. In the first week, we talked about how Jesus was tenacious, and he called us to cling to God even in the midst of difficult circumstances. In the second week, we talked about how the way of Christ is hopeful and how we are offered light in the darkness and that we are really to shift our perspective in new ways. Last week, we talked about how the way of Christ is merciful and how mercy is really just compassion and action and how we are to offer that to one another. And now today, we come to the fourth Sunday in Lent, and we're going to talk about how the way of Christ is faithful, and we're going to do that through the story of the bent over woman. So as we prepare our hearts and minds for the message this morning, let us pray together. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Where were you a year ago? That's a question we ask in response to tragedy. Do you remember where you were the moment you heard the news that and then fill in the blank of a tragic event? Do you know where you were when you heard that Kennedy was assassinated? Do you know where you were when you heard that they shot Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you know where you were when the planes hit the towers at 9-11? And now do you remember where you were, what you were doing when you found out that the world shut down? It was this Sunday last year that we as a church, out of an abundance of caution, decided we would go virtual. We assumed it would be for about two weeks and then we would be back to business as usual, and yet here we are a year later, still virtual for the most part and surrounded by a forever changed world. There was an article that came out last year in the fall when we had lost 137,000 Americans to the coronavirus. And it estimated that with those numbers, 137,000, with those numbers, there was 1.22 million, 
one million twenty-two, that had lost a close family member. We have now lost more than 530,000 Americans to the coronavirus. And we have millions that are grieving in our country, in our world, the loss of a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, a child, a sibling, a coworker, or a friend. Or know somebody who has been fundamentally affected in a negative way by this virus. And so this morning, one of the things that Wendy and Kristen and I wanted to do was we wanted to acknowledge the great loss among us. We wanted to acknowledge that our lives didn't go the way that we wanted them to last year. And that we didn't get to do the things that we wanted to do or see the people that we wanted to see, that we didn't get to live our lives the way we wanted to live them. We spent a year isolated, a year apart, and some lost people that they loved. And while we have hope for what is to come with vaccines and treatment right now, what we are feeling is still raw. And it is emotional and it is painful and it is hard. And I think in our scripture this morning, we find hope. We find hope for healing, healing for our brokenness, for our world's brokenness, healing for our hurts and for our suffering. Healing for when we feel isolated and set apart. What we find this morning in a scripture is the faithful way that Christ reaches out to us when we can't reach out to him. You see, the woman who was crippled, the bent over woman, she had a spirit for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. And she does not ask for healing in our story this morning. Instead, Jesus calls to her. And sets her free from her ailment by laying hands on her. Her response is to stand up straight and immediately to begin praising God. And I think it's striking that she does not ask for healing and no one petitions Jesus on her behalf. It's not like the paralyzed man whose friends lowered him through a roof to Jesus. It's not like her reaching up and touching his robe like the bleeding woman did in the parable we read, story we read a few weeks back. She does not beseech Jesus' help. She doesn't have anybody around her, a support system that is trying to help her reach Jesus either. Instead, over the years, she has become accustomed to, if not resigned to, her long and serious illness. I imagine that for 18 years, this unnamed woman in Scripture struggled to see the sun. Struggled to see the sky and the stars because for 18 years her world has been one of just turning side to side to see what those who stand upright can see at just a glance. She is used to this. And no one questions her fate. Instead, the leaders of the synagogue get offended that Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. And I think it would be really easy for us this morning to focus on the callousness of the leader of the synagogue. To, frustrate, uh, to be frustrated by the way he responds to Jesus' healing. To talk about how we as the people of the church often prioritize what we think God wants us to do and what we think the Bible says, and yet so often we miss the point or we miss the mark because we prioritize what we think over people. And what we see time and time again in Scripture is Jesus prioritizing people. And so I think it's important to look at what comes before the story of the unnamed woman in Scripture and also what comes after. Because this passage is nestled between the parable of the fig tree with its focus on repentance and the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven and their focus on the kingdom of God, the realm of God. And how to address discouragement and despair over what we feel we have when we believe we have failed. So why is a story of healing found between two parables featuring such uncontrollable events as mustard, a call for repentance, and leaven, a description of God's kingdom. And what does that reveal to us about the surprising and powerful way that God connects with us? And how God reaches out to us when we can't or won't reach out to God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, In Jesus, the message and the messenger were one. And that's our calling too, to tell the message and to be the message, to be compassionate, forgiving, and loving, and to follow in the footsteps of God. 
So I think that's our answer. And now we're going to unpack that together this morning. You see, compassion is a reflection of God. This is seen very vividly in our passage today. Jesus once again heals on the Sabbath. This is not the first time he's healed on the Sabbath. He's doing it again. And I think he does it to show us God's priorities. This woman has been bent over for 18 years. In other passages in Luke where Jesus heals on the Sabbath, we see a man with a crippled hand. And I like to to think about this. These are not life-threatening illnesses. Being bent over and having a crippled hand are not life-threatening illnesses. They don't demand immediate healing. If you took these illnesses into an emergency room, you would be waiting a long time as other things were prioritized over your illness. And so I, I say that to say this. They could have waited to be healed until after the Sabbath. They could have waited to be healed until after the Sabbath. And yet, Jesus shows us that no quality is more beautiful than compassion. No attitude is more reflective of God. Jesus tells the religious leaders and us that if we have the power to help, if we have the power to end someone's suffering, then we should do it. We've seen that play out on a global stage this year as we have dealt with the coronavirus and we've been challenged to do simple things like wear a mask for the care of others. If we can do it, if it's in our power to do it, then Jesus calls us to do it. One clear admonition that leaps out in this passage is this. Be more compassionate. If you want to be like God, start here. Be more compassionate. To be compassionate means to get into another person's shoes, to really try to think and feel what they might be thinking and feeling. And oh, how we need this great attribute in all of our relationships right now. I still get a lot of uh, emails from different uh, youth leadership sites and things to send to parents or relate. And an article came up recently in my inbox that said, how to raise your parents. And it contains these tongue-in-cheek suggestions for being more compassionate towards your parents for teenagers. Here are a couple of them that I like. Do not be afraid to speak your parents' language. Try using strange-sounding phrases like, I will help you with the dishes, and yes. Try to understand their music. Play a CD of one of their favorite tunes until you're accustomed to the sound. Be patient with the underachieving parent. When you catch your dieting dad sneaking food, do not show your disapproval. Tell them that you love them no matter what. Encourage your parents to talk about their problems. Try to keep in mind that to them, things like earning a living and paying off a mortgage may seem important. And be tolerant of their appearance. When your dad gets a haircut, do not feel personally humiliated. Remember, it's important to him to look like his peers. And most of all, if they do something wrong, let them know that it is their behavior you dislike, not themselves. Remember, parents need to feel they are loved too. In a lighthearted way, this writer is saying something very important. Namely, that we would all be better off if we were more compassionate, more patient, more understanding in the world. Remember how Jesus said it? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then remember how compassionately he dealt with the bent over woman today and how he deals with the woman caught in adultery in scripture as well. The mob was ready to stone her to death, but not Jesus. He wanted no part in condemning people. His was a heart of compassion and he said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and from now on do not sin again. When you read the New Testament, one thing is sure. It is compassion that shines through over and over and over again. Compassion is a reflection of God. So how do we do that as followers of the way? How do we show compassion in the world? How do we show compassion to ourselves and to each other? How do we show compassion to people who frustrate us or who do things that we don't agree with? How do we show compassion How do we live a life of care and reaching out? And I think a great modern day example of this was Mr. Rogers. A while ago, a story a lawyer wrote on the 
his interaction with a man who was fundamentally changed by watching Mr. Rogers' show. And it traveled around Facebook for a while. And his life was forever changed by Mr. Rogers, even though he had never met him in person. Now, I want to just preface this this morning before I tell this story, that this is a story of a child who was an abuse victim. And so if that is a trigger warning for you, you can go ahead and mute me this morning. And when that story is over, I'll just raise my hand up like this so that you know that you can unmute me and come back. I just want to make sure as we're talking about compassion that we're compassionate to those who this story might be hurtful and harmful to. So I'm going to tell that story now so you can go ahead and hit the mute button, and then I'll just raise my hand when it's safe. A good portion of my pro bono work is defending abused children, says the lawyer. And it's a cause close to my heart. In the course of my work, I met a man who was an adult survivor. And you wouldn't have known it by looking at him. He was this gigantic Polynesian man. He had wild, curly hair, and I think of him every time I see the Justice League and Aquaman. He was counseling some of the little kids, and he was doing a fantastic job of it. I visited his home to get his opinion on something, and I noticed he had a little toy on his desk. It was a trolley. And naturally curious, I asked him about it. And this is what he told me. The most dangerous time for me was the afternoon when my mother got tired and irritable. Like clockwork. Now she liked to beat me in discreet places so my father wouldn't see the bruises. And that particular day, she went for the legs. Not uncommon for her. I was knocked down and I couldn't get back up, which was also not uncommon. She gave me one last kick, The one I had come to learn meant, I'm done now. And then she left me upstairs, face in the carpet alone. I tried to get up, but I I couldn't. And so I dragged myself arm over arm to the television, climbed up the TV cabinet, and turned on the TV. And there was Mr. Rogers. It was the end of the show, and he was having a quiet, calm conversation with the hundreds of kids who were watching. And in that moment, he seemed to look me in the eye when he said, And I like you just for being you. In that moment, it was like he was reaching across time and space to say those words to me when I needed them most. It was like the hand of God. It hit me in the soul. I was a miserable little kid. I was sure I was a horrible person. I was sure I deserved every last moment of abuse, every blow, every bad name. I was sure I earned it. Sure, I didn't deserve better. I knew all of these things until that moment. If this man who I hadn't even met liked me just for being me, then I couldn't be all bad. Then maybe someone could love me even if it wasn't my mom. And it gave me hope. If that nice man liked me, then I wasn't a monster. I was worth fighting for. And from that day on, his words were like a secret fortress in my heart, no matter how broken I was. No matter how much it hurt or what was done to me, I could remember his words. Get back on my feet and go on for another day. And that's why I keep that toy trolley there. To remind me that no matter how terrible things look, someone who had never met me liked me just for being me. And that makes even the worst day worth it to me. I know how silly that sounds. But Mr. Rogers saved my life. Now the the next time that I saw him, he was talking to one of my little clients. And when they were done with their session, he walked her out of her chair and took both of her hands, looked her in the eyes and said, and remember, I like you just for being you. And then the lawyer said this, that is to me Mr. Rogers' most powerful legacy. All of the little lives he changed and made better with simple and sincere words of love and kindness. Compassion is a reflection of God. And the way of Christ is faithful to us. When we feel like we can't go on anymore, when like the bent over woman and like this young man, we feel like we can't even reach out, God reaches out to us. And God pulls us in and offers healing. You see, one of the reasons we all love Mr. Rogers so much is the way that he modeled Christ in his everyday life. 
I have heard hundreds, if not thousands, of stories about the impact of Mr. Rogers. And he did what all of us are called to do. He followed the way of Christ. He was faithful to God, and he dedicated his life to Christ. And in doing so, it was the simple, very small, everyday acts of compassion and kindness and the way that he lived his life that left the legacy that we see today. A legacy of mercy and kindness and compassion and justice, and that is our calling as well, to live our everyday, ordinary lives and follow the way of Christ. The way of Christ is faithful. And what we usually talk about when we talk about faithful is the way in which we are faithful to God. But what we see in our scripture today is the way that Christ is faithful to us. The broken, the downtrodden, the left behind, the ones who feel unworthy, the ones who feel unwanted, the ones who are on the margins. Christ is faithful to us. Christ cares for us. Christ reaches out to us and then calls us to do the same. You see, one of the powerful things that Jesus does in this passage today is not just heal the bent-over woman. He lays his hands on her. This seemingly unnecessary second step distinguishes this miracle from the previous Sabbath healing that we see in chapter 6 when the man with the withered hand is healed. Because Jesus just commands him to extend his hand, and he is healed. Or when Jesus removes the unclean demon, he just casts it out with a word. But Jesus is doing something powerful here in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has a two-part healing, and it allows him to touch a woman who is unclean, and thereby he restores her, not just physically, but socially. Consider the various instances in Luke's Gospel where Jesus violates Jewish custom and he touches unclean people. He touches a leper, the widow of Nain's dead son. He is touched by the bleeding woman. And touching would convey a sense of uncleanliness. And although unnecessary in the light of Jesus' ability to heal by command, he doesn't have to touch these people. It's a frequent occurrence in the Gospel of Mark. Touching says symbolically that Jesus does not care for his own sake and that those he heals are viewed as unclean. Instead, he is not going to allow the threat of being unclean keep him from redeeming the wounded and thus the marginalized. In each of these instances, his touch represents fellowship for those whose ailments may have denied them human contact. And Jesus' touch is their initial welcome back to community. Kate Bowler says it this way. Perhaps today we can take down our thick walls, revealing the realness of what it means to be human, fragile and flawed, one who makes mistakes and one who's sometimes afraid. It is right there that we are welcomed into the arms of Christ, welcomed to walk the path during this season of Lent. The path where all who are human are welcome no matter their state. And that's the reminder that we have in this passage. We come to God in an unclean state. We come to God broken. We come to God separated. We come to God feeling like we don't belong. And yet Jesus reaches out and touches us and offers healing. The way of Christ is faithful. Christ is faithful to us and is calling us to be faithful to Christ. Christ is redeeming us. And we have this reminder this morning that Christ is the great healer. We are all like the bent over woman, unable to look up and see the sun. We know the struggle. We see the dust and the dirt underneath our feet. We struggle to see the path that is before us straining and twisting because we cannot look straight ahead. We know the pain of loss. We know the feeling of isolation. And after this year, we understand loneliness in a whole new way. And yet we know that Christ is the great healer. And even when we feel apart, he is calling us, inviting us in, and Jesus offers us an invitation to mend our souls and a challenge for us to then go and mend creation. We are inheritors of the gift of healing. We have the power to invite people in, to offer compassion to those who desperately need it to offer love to those who feel unloved, and in Jesus, 
the message and the messenger were one. And that's our calling too, to tell the message and be the message, to be compassionate, forgiving, and loving, to follow the way of Christ. Amen. As we come to our time in the service where we have the opportunity to give, this year has been a year of change, a year of heartache, a year of unknown. We are working together to continue to reach out to those who continue to be affected, to continue to nurture and to love those who feel unloved. Your gifts of your tithes and your offerings will help make a difference in the lives of so many. It will allow us to use it through our ministry. You can give by clicking the link in the chat or by going online at graceavenue.org and clicking the give offering um, link. Let us pray. Dear, gracious, and loving God, we give of ourselves. We have had a year of being bent over. And Lord, now we want to stand. We want to stand and focus on you and reach out to those within our community, within our world, within our touch. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
sing of the goodness of God. Oh, all my life, and all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. And every breath. What a blessing it has been to be in worship with you today as we commemorate, commiserate one year of being online together. It's been a difficult year, but we can see the end in sight. The people who have lived in darkness see a great light. And we're reminded that our faith and our hope and our joy is found in Christ and in God. As we prepare to go forward, we go forward with this blessing and benediction. Christ is faithful to us. When we feel broken, lost, beyond redemption, Christ is reaching out to us, offering compassion and love. And it is our great challenge and our great mission as followers of the way to offer that compassion and love to others. So may we be compassionate this week. May we be kind and caring this week. And may we seek to live out our faith in new ways. As you go forward, go forward with the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I hope that you have a great week and wherever life takes you. May you find your way back onto Grace Avenue. Amen.